The moon is transgender. Since I discovered this poem a few weeks ago, every night I look out and I search for the moon and I think about gender identity. What does that really mean to me or anybody else? And I spent my childhood in a time where, of course, we didn't talk about these things at all. There wasn't even an option to think about it. So I've also been immersed in reading poetry by other transgender artists. And the poetry, which I have here, is so robust and so honoring. It's also really gritty at times. You're down deep in the human experience. It can be crude when it's expressing frustration. There are many subjects and many experiences and often not about being trans. That is not the only thing going on in these people's lives. But there is a struggle in all these poetry books about being seen and heard and accepted and about self-discovery and how long that journey is. Today, rather than next Sunday, I chose to launch uh, International Trans Day of Visibility uh, 12 days early because I'm hoping we will spend the next 12 days thinking about how we personally can honor transgender people, both on March 31st and for the rest of our lives. So it gives us a little time to think between Mar now and March 31st. And I will tell you, as a transplant to Montana from a more liberal state, um, a legislatively more liberal state, let me rephrase that, I am realizing how our trans siblings here are being targeted by those whose dehumanizing rhetoric holds so much transphobia and hate. I read the paper, trans children's lives are being used for political purposes. Choices are being taken away from these children and their families by the target of gender affirming healthcare. Imagine not being able to make healthcare choices for your own children. I know many of you have called your legislators, you've written your legislators, you've written to committee members, and our very own uh, Cami Armijo Grover has been uh, giving testimony up in Helena several times um, in her job at Bridger Care. So when you see her next time, she's not here this morning, but when you see her next time, give her some love. Giving testimony is a hard, hard thing. So may our love and belief in the worth and dignity of trans children be deep and unwavering. The dehumanizing actions demand a constant vigilance from trans people. This vigilance is woven into a poem by uh, Meg Day from her book of poetry, The Last Psalm at Sea Level. And this is a stunning book of poetry about all kinds of things. This poem is labeled, battered, um, named Batter My Heart, Transgendered God. And for any of you poetry fans, I know you heard the John Dunn in that. Batter my heart, transgendered God, for yours is the only ear that hears. Place fear in my heart, where faith has grown my senses dull and reassures my blood that it will never spill. Show every part to every stranger's anger. Surprise them with my drawers full of maps that lead to vacancies and chart the distance from my pride and my core. Terror, do not depart but nest in the hollows of my loins and keep me on all fours. My knees bring me down and my head bows again. Replay the murders of my kin until my mind's made new. You, O oh duo, O oh twin, whose likeness is kind, but unwind my confidence and noose it around your fist so that I might know the vivid impermanence. I must have read that 10 times because there's so much in it. But the part for this morning is how to not ever let down that vigilance when you're a transgender person. You can't ever think that you're truly safe. 
And that is Meg Day's lived experience. It's also, I'm sure, Day knows the horroring, harrowing and horrifying statistics about transgender people. I gathered some data from National Institutes of Health, from the Trevor Project, who surveyed over 34,000 youth, and UCLA, a project on LGBTQ health. The Trevor Project is especially interesting because they break down these experiences by state. So in the state of Montana, 55% of trans or non-binary people have considered suicide. 13% have attempted. Our trans and non-binary youth in this country, 57% of them reporting symptoms of depression and 79% living with symptoms of anxiety. 50% of LGBTQ students in Montana have experienced harm or threats of harm. Trans people are over four times more likely to experience violent victimization than the general population. They are seven times more likely to experience physical violence when interacting with the police. And in this country, it is black trans women who are at the highest risk of violence anywhere, and it includes homicide. So Trans Visibility Day is important to us because people are suffering. So I want to look today at the needs of transgender people. We just talked about Montana, but also in our Unitarian Universalist um, population at large. We're going to ask ourselves what further education we need of our hearts and our minds and what supportive actions we might take. You have an entire glossary of terms in your order of service that you can take home with you and read at your leisure. But for the sake of this sermon, trans or transgender is used to refer to all people whose gender identities, or lack of, do not align according to the mainstream expectations with the sex they were assigned at birth. So, as I talked about during Black History Month, it is so important to celebrate. It is important to hear the stories of pain, but it is also so important to celebrate. So as we move toward International Transgender Day of Visibility, let's take in art by trans people and music and writing and stories. I will put the three books of poetry out for borrowing. People can take them. I don't know if there's a wonderful transgender, um, transgender artists have a gallery on display up in Helena. I don't know if that is still there through the end of the month or not. You'd want to check on our website before you go. Google up some TED Talks, go to a PFLAG site, and there will be more resources in our April newsletter. I also want to talk about TRUST, which is a Unitarian Universalist group in 2014. The acronym stands for trans, I know I'm not going to get this right, Transgender Religious Professionals of Unitarian Universalists Together. So it's spelled T-R-U-U-S-T. So TRUST is fairly new. And as they were gathering, they were aware that Unitarian Universalism had long taken pride in becoming a welcoming LGBTQ faith, welcoming people of all gender, gender identities and sexual orientations. However, the people who went on to found trust knew that we didn't always live up to our aspirations. For any of you who have been to my Article 2 workshops, you have heard this quote before. This is from Viola Abbott. We are brought here today by the fact that Unitarian Universalism has fallen short of the image that was presented to the world and to many of those who embrace this religion. But we are also brought here today by the truth that Unitarian Universalism has shifted course to move toward a place of wholeness, a place that may have not ever fully existed in the denomination. We're here today because we're mindful of that past, but we have hope for the future. 
We want the practice of this faith to be a fulfilling manifestation of its promise. End quote. And of course we have fallen short because we are human. And of course we have fallen short because we don't have the information 20 years ago and 40 years ago and 60 years ago that we have today. So we are just asking ourselves to step in to learn more about what's available to us. So in the spring of 2018, Trust joined with the Unitarian Universalist Association's Multicultural Ministries to conduct a survey of trans people in UU. They had 278 people respond, and the comment from the study group is that they represented an incredible diversity of identities and experiences. So who are these folks in Unitarian Universalism? They found the majority of trans UUs are non-binary, which means they don't identify exclusively as a man or a woman, might be pansexual or bisexual, have one or more disabilities. They're often young adults who've been raised up through UU. And they attend UU congregations at least once a month. So when compared to our UU population as a whole, they have less income, they're more likely to have been raised UU, and they're more racially diverse. So I'm sorry to tell you that the survey also says we have fallen down on spiritual care and connection for these folks, for inclusion, and there's problems with marginalization. I have some dry statistics in here, but what I want you to hear beyond the statistic is I'm actually going to read you voices of, of the respondents. So 44% of trans UUs feel spirit, only 44% feel spiritually connected and nourished in their congregations. One respondent says, the worship and community left me feeling empty, it felt like going through the motions. It was unrelated to my gender journey and to my experience. Another says, there was a lack of reflection of my experiences in worship and a lot of non-inclusive language. They also found that only half of trans UUs felt comfortable talking to their minister. One wrote, my minister engaged in an active bullying campaign toward me. Another says, there was just a lack of space for people like me, not actively inclusive to trans, queer, working class, or disabled people. The majority of trans UUs who attend a congregation feel responsible for education on trans identity and concerns. One respondent says, I was tired of being the only person to try to bring trans awareness into the congregation, and I didn't feel safe as myself. Another said, I got tired of constantly reminding about gender, class, race, and inclusion. Seventy-two percent felt their congregation was not completely inclusive of trans people. The congregation says that it is welcoming, but there's a lot of transphobia, problematic behavior, and harmful ignorance that I encounter regularly. And another voice, congregational leaders deny the existence of non-binary reality and express disregard for my gender identity. I felt isolated due to classism and educational elitism. I was not out yet as a trans individual, but the only other trans person I knew in the congregation was constantly misgendered, even by their minister, despite repeated reminders. And for those who go on to try to be UU professionals, try to be ministers or directors of children's religious education, they have also had a very long, hard road. There were no openly trans ministers in our congregations until 2002. And it wasn't until 2017 that an openly trans UU minister of color received final fellowship. And final fellowship is doing all your requirements, and then working in congregations for three to four years. One person. 
No openly trans woman has ever been called to settled ministry as of 2019. I believe that has changed. I believe there is now one in a California congregation. So this is what some of our professionals had to say. After about seven years in parish ministry, I could no longer deny my identity. I came out to my district executive, and their response was to tell me I needed to leave my congregation immediately and not tell them why. I was also encouraged to seek a completely new career. Another uh, religious educator, I learned that someone in charge of hiring didn't want to hire a non-binary applicant because he believed that identifying as neither a man nor a woman was a sign of immaturity. So how do we not be one of those congregations, even in part? I think we would do better than these statistics, but I also don't want us to have a false sense of how prepared we are. So the Trevor Project, which um, listened to over 34,000 voices, says these are the basic things that make affirming space. People who are accepting in general of different things. Did you see the sign that's out front on our building this morning? Yes. Visible pride flags, use of preferred pronouns, which we can put on our name tags easily, LGBTQ people in visible positions of decision making, and the openness of others to the LGBTQ experience. And we definitely do some really good things here. We, we happen to have all gender bathrooms. We offer our whole lives. We work against anti-trans legislation. Cami and I recently met with members of the MSU Queer Straight Alliance to hear their suggestions to create more welcoming space and how we can support them. I hope to have those in the April newsletter. And an extremely accessible framework for us would be um, to follow the UUA Welcoming Congregation 5 practices. Oh, and the other thing I posted, I posted the poster from Trust about um, LBGTQ holidays and days of remembrance that we should be thinking about. So when I went to the Welcoming Congregational Renewal Form, I discovered the following. For congregations who have already gone through the process of being a welcoming congregation, which includes us, the UUA is saying, please consider a renewal process. If you don't do it, we're not going to remove your welcoming congregation status, but we have new information to offer. So, because things change over the decades. There are new people also in our congregations that never went through the original training. So these five things, the first one is to become a welcoming congregation, and we already have that one. Although I am wondering if someone can tell me what happened to our welcoming congregation sign, because we don't have it displayed anywhere, and I'm hoping we can hunt it down somewhere. The second is to have welcoming worship services throughout the year. And guess what? Today's our first day of doing that, which doesn't mean the entire day or the entire sermon has to be about it, but let's include chalice lighting words and let's maybe include a children's story. And I routinely use readings from people of color. I try to go to those readings first. And I will pledge to you, I will try harder to find readings from people of color who are also LGBTQ. I think we can ponder the relationship between racism and the trans experience. I think we can ponder the correlation between LGBTQ and adolescent homelessness in our community. The third, is, which is related to the second, is have welcoming days of observance so that people in our community can see that this is important to us. The fourth of five is welcoming religious education. 
And, you know, we have already delved into this several times. I want to give a thank you to Kitty Donich and Ida Colleen, who have offered the Trans Inclusion class from Transforming Hearts. They've offered that class several times, and as recently as last fall. If we were going to do a re-renewal, we have to have 10% of our membership attending some sort of education, which can be a book group, it can be a discussion group, it can be the trans class. We have many choices, and they're not necessarily um, um, requiring a lot of planning time. It requires us showing up with our hearts. And the fifth is to financially support a local or national organization, campaigns or projects that uplift the dignity of LGBTQ people. This can be as simple as a second Sunday offering to our local Queer Straight Alliance. And as I mentioned, Cami and I have a few um, suggestions from our MSU Queer Straight Alliance. So that's a lot of information to take in this morning, I know. Um, I don't, the, the newsletter will come out, we should ponder. There's um, on a gold piece of paper over here, there are books um, for children about LGBTQ and some as beautifully as beautiful as the story about Teddy that we wrote, read this morning. So you can pick up the goldenrod. Um, it's on the, whatever we call that, the bulletin board, the carousel. I will also tell you that um, there's an ask for action. They have specifically asked us to not put this on social media, so I did not put it on the listserv. But please come up and get one of these blue flyers. And I will say, this isn't going to change current legislation. But what it does do is show our, our tangible support for the trans community. So that's why I got pretty excited about it when I saw it. I thought, huh, do we do this? How much impact do we have? And then I thought, the impact is not necessarily about legislation. It is about being visible in our support of trans folks. So you will not find it on the listserv. You will hear, find it here. And if you are watching um, via YouTube this morning, just email me and I'll send it to you. Or Cami will send it to you. One of us will. So I want to leave us with a beautiful story from the Reverend Sean Parker Dennison. He's one of the co-founders of Trust. And his poem, he also serves as a minister in Ashland, Oregon, which is how I know him. Um, his poem calls us into communion with one another. And it shares a bit about his personal story. So Sean Parker Dennison. I give thanks for my broken body, my trans body. I give thanks for the scars and the missing pieces and the inability to feel at home, here. It keeps me restless, but undaunted. I give thanks for my body and what has marked it and made it holy and unique and, yes, brave. I bless my own body, and that blessing is mine. It does not extend past the surface of my skin. It does not substitute for anyone else. It does not ask forgiveness for being. I will break bread only with those who know that breaking and blessing are one thing, who worship the breaking open and the broken down, who refuse to be given away, but give themselves over to the blessing of being embodied and sacred and free. I will dine with people who know all the ways to bless and break and give we to each other who take and eat and give everything at this table, who do not need another communion or any other paradise or anyone's permission to be free. Amen.